Well, I don't know exactly when it happened. And I'll admit that as a 49-year-old, like, dad, I'm probably not in the most cutting-edge demographic. All I know is it happened, and it is awesome. I, as Kramer used to say on Seinfeld, I'm out there, Jerry, and I'm loving it. I'll tell you that. Now, of course, I'm talking about stretchy jeans. Now, here's the thing about stretchy jeans. They're so amazing, and I, I, I don't know when they came around for men. All I know is that I tried one pair of stretchy jeans, and I am hooked. I mean, like, look like jeans, feel like sweatpants. That is a miracle. I'm just saying, like, and it's amazing because I bought one pair and then I realized like I'm gonna have to buy all stretchy jeans because I just can't wear the other ones anymore like like I've got still like the real jeans that are made out of cotton or whatever but this new magic I just want to do like lunges all the time now when I'm wearing them I could just like maybe I'll do is this distracting well I would run out of breath and I probably should have stretched out first but I mean it's just amazing like once you try the stretchy jeans you are not going to be able to wear them in fact like, <laughs> I, I've worn them, like, we'll work out at night, and I, I just don't wear sweatpants anymore because of them, and they're awesome. But the problem is um, that, I know this is going to shock you, I'm not a professional preacher, I'm a professional painter. That's how I get paid. And <laughs> so the problem is, at work, I wear these. Um, and these are white painter's pants, and they are cotton, and they are sort of the opposite of stretchy. In fact, if you look, like, these are new ones. Um, <laughs> and they're just like, they almost stand out straight by themselves, and you get a little paint and a few washes, and they will literally stand up in the corner, and they don't stretch at all, and so the problem is, like, on nights and weekends and Sundays, I get to wear the awesome stretchy jeans that feel like sweatpants, but then, like, on, when I go back to work, um, it is difficult to get these things on sometimes. Sometimes I'm doing the jump thing, <laughs> trying to get these on, and it's always shocking. I'm like, did these shrink? I'm like yelling at my wife, like going, what are you washing this in? What are you drying? I mean, they're sh but the problem is like, these just don't change. They're like so restrictive and uncomfortable, and it's just a problem, and, and, and so that really has nothing to do with my sermon. I just wanted to tell you that. I'm struggling. No, no, seriously, kind of does, kind of does, and here's why. Because we live in a stretchy jeans world when it comes to sexuality, don't we? I mean, let's just admit this. Like, when most of our week, most of our week, like, sort of anything goes and the shows we watch and the music we listen to and sort of everything goes and nothing's frowned upon unless you get caught. <laughs> and so, like, it's this stretchy jeans world and it's sort of comfortable because you can just sort of let your freak flag fly and nothing is wrong, nothing. And then, 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 the problem is um, we kind of open up the Bible or we come into church and then it's sort of the white pants and they're very restrictive and very uncomfortable to go oh this is what the bible says about sexuality or this is what my church says about sexuality or this is and so it's very 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 difficult and so that's why <laughs> we're going to talk about sex today which you're like i would have rather you talked about fitting into your pants even though i'm uncomfortable about that but but here's the thing about it um I think it's very important that we do that occasionally. Now, if you've been part of Action Church for a long time, you know that over almost 10 years, this is not a go-to uh, thing that we talk about for a reason. And if it's your first week, you're welcome. Like, you've got to be excited about this, right? And you're really hating the person who invited you. But, but here's, here's why we don't talk about it much, because here's the thing that I feel like. I feel like most of the time, most of us at least, sort of know what the Bible says about those things. Um, and, 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 I think that Christians, let's just be honest, Christians, as Christians, we love to talk about the sins we're not committing, right? Like, nothing excites me more if I get to talk about some problem you have that doesn't affect me. Um, and, and so because of that, I don't make a big deal, I'll talk about that a lot, but, but I think it's important that we do occasionally because there can be confusion. There can be times where you're like, well, I'm not even sure anymore like <laughs> what the Bible says about sexuality, and I'm not, and so that's why we're gonna do that this morning. Now, here's the good news. 
Um, I've admitted to you I'm not a professional preacher. I am a pretty good painter, but that's really not going to help in this situation. Uh, but, 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 we actually have precedent for this kind of talk, and we have something, sort of a framework that's really helpful. Now, I spent like 30 minutes yakking about this last week, and it was a holiday weekend, so you might have missed it. You can check out the podcast. But what we walked away from last week that in situations where things are difficult, in situations where, as, as Mitch said in the opening, like they're not comfortable and people could be offended and whoo, we got to figure this out. We have a really good framework for, from Scripture to do this because there was a time, there was a time when all of us, everyone in this room probably, unless you're an Orthodox Jew this morning, like all of us would have been on the outside and we wouldn't have been accepted in church because when Jesus came to earth, he was a Jew and he surrounded himself with Jews. So all of the first Christians were Jews and honestly, they never even imagined that non-Jews, non-religious Jews would become part of their thing until later like people who weren't Jews, people like you and and I started coming into the faith, and quite frankly, they didn't know what to do with us. They're like, I'm not sure you can, you know, if you're not sure that you can wear, wear yoga pants and be a Christian, they were super not sure that you could be a Christian and not be a Jew first. So what they did, they did three things that are super helpful to us. Number one, they had empathy, and I think that's so important, and we don't want to miss that. In fact, Peter, maybe one of the most famous um, apostles, and the one we always think of as like being sort of a spokesman for the faith, he stood up and he said in this meeting that we got to read about in, in Acts 15, you could check it out there, um, he basically had empathy and he said these words which I think are so sort of powerful. He said, why are we trying to make all of these non-Jewish people be Jews when we're not even good Jews? He admitted, he's like, we don't follow the rules of Judaism. In fact, the reason why we're here, the reason why we have surrendered to Jesus, the reason why we've sort of left that faith and become Christians is because we weren't very good Jews. We didn't follow all the laws. We, and so he admitted like, oh, we fail as well. And so that's important. That's always going to be part of our discussion, I think, as, as, as Action Church, at least. Like, we need to look to that and go, we need to have empathy. We need to imagine what it's like to come from the outside. We need to imagine, for, you know, to walk into this place and go, oh, I hope he doesn't talk about my sexuality. I hope he doesn't talk about this thing that I'm involved in. I hope he doesn't talk because, quite frankly, we don't keep all the rules. And we're not. So that's important. Like, empathy, understanding, like, oh. We're sinners, and, and, and it must feel very, very difficult to kind of come from the outside and come in and have people kind of judge you on what you're doing. So that, and, and here's another thing they did that I think is so important. It says that they listened quietly to each other, and they had a long discussion. Um, and, and I think that's so important. It's so neat to go, hey, all these guys came from different viewpoints because there were people there going, hey, I think Gentiles can come in and be Christians without being Jews. And there are other people going, no, Jesus was a Jew, and we're all Jews, so if you're going to be a Christian, you have to be a Jew, and you have to keep all of the laws of Judaism. And so they had different, and, and then, so they're, this discussion, they're putting themselves sort of in the position of the people that were on the outside, which is you and I. Like, we probably wouldn't be here today if they hadn't made that decision. So I think those two things are important. Like, without empathy, we're just jerks, right? Like, you've experienced that. I've experienced that in church. You know, they're just like Christian jerks. Now, without empathy, we become jerks. Without the discussion part, we become ignorant, right? Like, we just don't know what's going on. We're not aware. So empathy, discussion, very important, but they didn't stop there. And, and that's so important, too. Because if you just stop with empathy and discussion, maybe, maybe, maybe we come out with the wrong decision on things. And so what they did is they came out and go, okay, here's, here's the way we feel about this. Here's, we, we have empathy. We discussed it. But then in the end, James stood up and he quoted scripture and he sort of brought it all back to, well, this is what the scripture that we have. This is what the prophet Isaiah said about this. And that's how they put this all together. Now, it, it's it, just let me tell you as far as the empathy part where I'm coming from this morning. Um, 
I was raised in the church. I was raised, and my dad's a Baptist minister. I basically, if you would like to imagine how I was raised, it was footloose, and I'm not even joking. Even dancing was wrong, which is probably good because I can't dance. But anyway, other than, <laughs> I was raised in footloose, was very rebellious, and actually was just a, I, I would just call myself a, just a jerk. And then, <laughs> Lots of people call me that. That's not a big deal. Just a promiscuous dirtbag. That would be the nice way of saying what I was. Then I met Michelle, who is my wife today, and just fell in love with her. And we were sort of going to church. She was more serious about it than I was, which made me more serious about church because anywhere that she was, I wanted to be. Um, and so we sort of did what, and this was 1988, you know, 89, and it was in the Bible Belt. So now what would sound very normal was just shocking then that we started, we moved in together. Where having sex and then all of a sudden like over time I'm like you know what I'm feeling guilty because I don't think that's right and I really do love this woman and I want to marry her and so I actually had that awkward talk with her I'm like I think we should stop having sex and I want and I proposed to her although I proposed really badly because I didn't have a ring and I was really broke so I'm like I'm gonna get you a ring <laughs> which I eventually did but it was like two weeks before the wedding I ain't even gonna lie like it, <laughs> and she doesn't even wear that ring anymore because it sucks so bad but anyway that's another story um, she had very bad taste in men, obviously. But so, so that was sort of our story. And, and it, to add to that, like here we're in the Bible Belt, and she's divorced and has a kid, and we're both young. And so I move out, and I move in with a Christian roommate, which turned out to be a real mistake because I ain't going to lie, like I didn't come home a lot of nights. And so my Christian roommate, being a good Christian roommate and caring about me, what he did is gossip to everyone in the church that I wasn't coming home at night. And so when it came down, this is real, this is my story and then when it came down to time to get married we went to the pastor of the church and said would you marry us we really love each other and he went I can't uh, which was awkward you know he's like I can't I know you're living together and all these problems like I can't in good conscience marry you and you might think I'm gonna say oh what a jerk he was a bad guy no he wasn't he actually showed his love for us and going I can't marry you like I I don't feel good about it and I, my, my elder board would kill me if I did. But, but here's the thing. You can use the church. And in fact, it was interesting. They were remodeling. And he literally was there the night before, like working to make sure the carpet was in and the pews got. It was just, he showed his love so much in like letting us have the church and was there even though he couldn't perform the ceremony. So that's a little bit of my story. So I just want you to know that I'm not coming to you this morning going, oh, man, let me tell you about sex because I've got it all figured out. Like, you can probably, you and I can probably match mistake for mistake. It's sin for sin. And, like, I will tell you that the good news is that by God's grace, got married in 1990, and I've had, like, been married for, like, 12 happy years since then. Um, you do the math. But anyway, it works out fine. Anyway, <laughs> that's a bad joke. I'm going to get in trouble for that, but I always have to say that. <laughs> okay, so that's empathy, discussion. Like, I, I understand but, but here's some of the thought when it comes to Scripture. Uh, Michelle would probably make that number lower. But anyway, I'm, I'm the positive one. But, but here's the thing. When it comes to that, you go, okay, well, we've got empathy. We can discuss these things. We cannot be ignorant of what's going on in the world. But when it comes to using Scripture, uh, let's just be sort of honest, even though it's uncomfortable to talk about in church, there's a lot of arguments against using a 2,000, 4,000, 6,000-year-old book and it's not even a book. The scripture isn't a book. It's more like a library of things written at different times by different people of all different styles. Some of it's poetry, some of it's fiction, some of it's nonfiction, some a lot of it's like prophecy and things that prophets said that God said. And so it's like, how do you use that? And so there's a lot of arguments. People, people go, it's old. I mean, how can they know what we should be doing in 2017? And others would say it's unclear, which I would agree, because there's a lot of things that you just read and you go, oh, I need to figure that out. It's not always, an, and we said last week, like, the Bible is not God's little instruction book. As much as we like to say that, like, are there things that, man, we can be taught from it, we can be convicted of sin in it, we can learn, oh, it's the best book, that's why I teach from it every week, but it's not like you open it up and it goes, here's what you do about, it just doesn't work that way. Um, lots of different cultures in the Bible, like over the thousands of years, culture changed and, and ideas changed and morality changed and science, you know, like they didn't understand some things we did, and so, and, and it's even interesting kind of like as a 
um, pastor and as a, someone who thinks about scripture a lot, like even how that changed, because I would have told you up until a few years ago, I would have told you, well, wait a minute. As much as we like to think of culture changing, there's nothing that we're doing now that wasn't in the Bible. Because you look at the Roman Empire, you look at the Greeks, you go, oh, they had all the things that we had. You know, they, every, kind of, every kind of like difficulty sexually that we deal with in our world, they had the same thing because nothing's really new under the sun, but they didn't have robots. So even that is wrong because I know there's some, you know, <laughs> there's somebody in the youth group going, yeah, but you didn't see that hot looking robot I saw. That's actually going to come. I mean, like, it's amazing. Like, I can't even say like they had everything we had because they don't, it changes, it does change. And quite frankly, we have to realize that people interpret it differently. I mean, there's people right now, and it's funny because you would think, I'm just gonna talk about homosexuality, which I'm not, I'm gonna talk about sexuality for all of us. Um, you will hear people take the same scripture and like go, hey, this is what I think it means, and someone else go, no, it's totally the opposite. So people interpret it different. Now, here's what I'm gonna do this morning. And I'm going to kind of put it back on you. But I will tell you, I'm going to show you a list of scriptures that I read this week. Not that I Googled, not that I just took out of some book. But these were scriptures that I read this week. And all of these scriptures condemn sex outside of a male-female marriage. So all of these, if you want to snap a picture, I know you're going to be embarrassed to do this. I'll send you this if you want. But <laughs> somebody's snapping pictures like, they're like, what are you looking off? I'm just saying, like, no, but you could. You could take a picture of this. I don't care. I'll smile. You know, that'd be cool. Like, I don't know. But, but like, you could take a picture of this. And you could go through and read these. I will just tell you that all of these scriptures say that the, the type of sexuality that is allowed in First of all, in Judaism and the God of the Old Testament into Christ, which a lot of times we go, well, that was Jesus. He was different. Well, he was a son of God and said, hey, guess what? I didn't come to knock out any of the law. I came to fulfill the law. And in fact, if, I, I know a lot of people go, well, Jesus didn't talk about sex much. And so we should go with Jesus. You don't want to go with Jesus. Because it, let me read you something Jesus said in Matthew 5, 27. Um, Jesus said, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. <laughs> and many of us would think, well, and then Jesus is going to say something really nice, but no big deal, I love you anyway. Here's what Jesus said. You've heard that it said you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who even looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And we're like, well, maybe Jesus, we don't want you to talk anymore because you're making it worse. <laughs> so this morning, <laughs> this morning, um, there's plenty of it for all of us to feel uncomfortable about because, because here's the thing what what the bible lays out in these scriptures is that god's plan for sexuality was an amazing gift god invented sex christians are not against sex we believe god <laughs> invented it um and, and so that god's gift was inside of a marriage and not just for procreation but it became this amazing sort of tape and this amazing i said tape not glue when it comes to sexuality because the thing about that is, I find that in reality and life, like, it's like tape. It's hard to put on and on and on and pull off and put on, and it gets less sticky over time. And so that's why God said these are two things, a bond between a man and a woman inside a marriage, having children or not having children, this will be the shared bond and pleasure that they will have. Now, those all say that, but I also have to go and go, hey, I had to look and find um, the scriptures that sort of, talk about approving sex outside of marriage. Um, because I, I think one thing that we do when it comes to scripture, and I see this a lot, like when, you know, the people go, hey, well, what about this verse? Or what about this verse? Or I think he was talking about this. We kind of kind of go through these scriptures, and I put all of them in there, if you would like. I mean, there's the ones that, like, call for the death penalty. There's ones with animals. I mean, this is a scary list. But we kind of try to break those down and go, well, I'm not sure that's right, or I'm not sure that's right. But this is just a list of all of them that condemn sex outside of the... And here's the ones that affirm it outside. Um, sorry, none of them. I couldn't find it. That's the thing I want you to remember this morning. As much as someone might go, I don't think this means that, or I don't think this means that, or culturally, I think that changed what I would say to you this morning is why I would have to kind of go back to Scripture and go, it's very clear, even though it's, you know, maybe not clear in each verse, it's clear as a pattern. The Scripture talks about all sorts of difficult relationships. We spent like a whole 
you know, month talking about how um, there was a slave owner and a slave who both became Christians. And there's a book called Philemon where, you know, you're dealing with how those two should relate to each other in Christ. So there's, it's not like scripture doesn't deal with difficult situations. They do all the time. But there's no sort of moment where they go, well, in this case, this was fine. Or in this case, this sex outside of marriage is fine. Or in this case, lusting after someone was fine. In fact, you find all sorts of examples of that in the Bible. Now, I'm not saying everyone in the Bible was sexually pure. In fact, you find sort of the worst perverts in the Bible. It's crazy. Like he had 15 wives. One of them was his sister. You're like, this is Game of Thrones or is this the Bible? I don't know. It's just crazy. But all of them, even though they might not condemn that, they kind of show, oh, and then this went wrong. And then, oh, boy, this is the, the sort of the fruit of that. And um, so let's go back, though. That's, that's sort of my research this week. You can run through those if you'd like. And maybe you, if, if you can find that verse that says, hey, this sex outside of marriage between a man and a female, male and a female is fine. Bring it to me. I have not found it. But let's go back to the letter that the council wrote um, when they were talking about you and I. Because that's really the story that we've been going through this month, this idea that they had the meeting, and then they used, you know, sort of empathy, and they discussed things, and then they sort of sat down and said, well, what does Scripture? So I want to read to you, I don't want to remind you, we read this last week, but I think it's so powerful. This is the letter that was sent out to you and I to people like you and I who weren't religious Jews and we were on the outside. And as much as you this morning are going, I don't know if people who wear yoga pants can be Christians. I'm not sure. Or you're going, I'm not sure if this group can be Christians. Or I'm not sure if you can do that with a Christian. All of us used to be on the outside because they're like, I'm not sure you can be a Christian and not be a religious Jew. But here's what they said. They said, This is the letter that was sent out. It said, For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay no greater burden on you than these few requirements. You must abstain from eating food offered to idols, from consuming blood or meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. And if you do this, you will do well. Farewell. And the messengers went out at once to Antioch, where they called a general meeting of the believers and delivered the letter. And there was great joy throughout the church that day as they read this encouraging message. Now, I want to point out a couple things. Number one, in this sort of proclamation, this practical guidelines, after, after thinking about what it must be like to be Gentile, sort of having empathy, and after much discussion, and after trying to applying scripture, they came up with this practical guideline, and they noticed two things. It said, and I like this about this, because I hate when people go, hey, God told me. That's always a sign that something bad is going to happen. He said, it seemed good to us in the Holy Spirit, meaning we've listened to God to the best of our ability, but this is still on us. Like, we're not perfect, so this is what we think, and this is what we think God would want us to do. That's very important. I love that. Super humble. This is important. But it also says, now notice this, it says there was great joy. You know, nobody got this letter and like kicking rocks going, oh, I can't believe we can't do that anymore. I'll throw off the bloody animals and I guess we can't have sex later. I mean, that is like not what happened here. What happened is they were like, oh, we knew something was going to change in our lives. Like we knew that if we were going to be Christians, I mean, and and understand now, this is very, very important. This is not the stuff we're talking about here. It's not about this is what everyone else should do. This is what Christians, in fact, I'll I'll break this down even smaller. You know, the practical guidelines for Action Church are you can come to Action Church. In fact, we hope you do, even if you don't believe what I'm saying or what other people believe here. Like, you are welcome. I mean, we have worked very hard, and I hope that it pays off, and I hope that you can see that. Do not be a place where you have to sort of check the box and believe exactly like you do. I love it when people go, (laughs) I don't get what you do, but I like the donuts. I like when people go, I don't believe like you, or I'm different, or I don't even believe in God. I mean, those are important people to us. And so understand, like, when it comes to this subject of sexuality, very important that we realize this is not us prescribing what your county should do or what laws we need to get passed. In fact, Paul would say, don't even think about trying to make people who aren't Christians act like Christians. Never works. Um, And here's another thing. 
And I get this question, I'm not going to say often, but it is a big question that people ask, even about, especially about homosexuality. They go, do you, do you affirm gays? And I go, no, no, no. We can't, or I can't, because of what I find that Scripture says. I showed you. You could research it yourself. But we can be really sinner-friendly without affirming sin. Because guess what? I don't know. And uh, I'm not even going to say that. That was being too nice. I know that there's not a single person in this room who could say, you know what? I'm perfect. I haven't broken any one of those things. I've never lusted after anyone. I've never had sex outside. I've never done any of those things. I'm perfect. I got it all down. I'm good to go. That's not true. And so like Peter, I would go, why would I try to tell people they, you know, can't sin sexually and they're not accepted if they do? Because, man, we're not even good at that ourselves. But, 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 what that doesn't mean is I go, hey, I'm going to tell you it's okay. Now, now here's why. And I think the why is very important. Um, because I know that can be difficult. Because I'm the one having those conversations. I'm the one getting those emails. People go, hey, what do you think about and is it okay if I, and I have to go, hey, here's what I think Scripture says. But here, here's what I think is important. Um, that being uncomfortable and sort of struggling with what the Bible says about sexuality, um, and for that matter, everything in life, I think that's a big part of God's plan. In fact, I think it's a feature, not a bug. Uh, not, it's not a bug. In fact, I've been thinking like about these white pants. Um, I know they look good, but it's more than just fashion with me. Um, not very comfortable. In fact, I've been really struggling with these pants. I'm just going to tell you, I don't know what's wrong with me. Like, I, I'm serious. I actually, this is not making it up for a fact. That last week, my wife made these lemon squares, um, and they weren't just like the regular lemon squares with just the powdered sugar on top. They had like a crust on the bottom. And I was like, this is the best tasting crust I've ever, I actually asked her, I'm like, what is different about this crust? And she said, <laughs> it's half confectioner sugar and half flour and butter. And I'm like, oh my God, every pie should be made that way from now on. Because it's delicious. And I found myself on the couch on Sunday afternoon with the spatula just eating out of the pan. And I had it in asked my daughter, this is absolutely true, and a jug of milk, not a glass of milk, a jug of milk down by the recliner just shoveling that stuff in, and I'm like, what is wrong with me? And then Tuesday, when I go back to work, I'm like, oh my God, it made a bad impression on me. I mean, like, I had a red line around, <laughs> you ever get that? Like, you wear these, but here's the thing, I've decided not to get bigger pants, guys do that, right? Like, we wear the same size pants. It might look different over the years, but I've decided not to get bigger pants. And I've said this before, but see, here's what I think about these pants. Like, as long as I wear these pants to work, and as long as they don't, God help us, don't let them come out with stretchy painter's pants. I'll, I'll be in a scooter in a week. But, <laughs> but as long as I have those pants, and as long as I just kind of decide, these are uncomfortable when I go outside the bounds of what I should eat. And I struggle to get into them. But you know what? Just, just being real, like I work with my hands, that's how I make my living. If I will sort of continue to struggle to get inside those pants, um, I feel sorry for the pants. But as for me, like I'll probably live longer. I definitely will, will make more money because I won't be in the scooter. I'll be able to work harder. I'll, I'll be healthier. My heart will thank. I mean, all of there's like a lot of good things that happen from that struggle, and that's what I would say to you this morning. Um, I understand if you struggle with that. In fact, I will say to you this, and this is with all the empathy in my heart, like I told you I've come from difficulty and I'm sinful and I still sin and my goodness I, I'm the last guy to say you should be perfect like I am but I'm just saying like if that bothered you if it made you uncomfortable if it sort of triggered you I'm not sorry and the reason why is because I think you're better off struggling with what the Bible says than sort of slipping into the stretchy pants of our culture I think you'll be happier. I think you'll have a better life. 
and I don't say that because I'm paid to say that or because the elder board told me to say that or because I'm worried I'll get in trouble if I don't say that. I'm just saying from my life experience and from what I know about Scripture and from listening to your stories and other stories and just sort of looking at life over the years, I would say the best thing that you could possibly do is go, I'm maybe failing in an area and I'm maybe sinning and I'm struggling with this, but I'm not going to throw out these pants because when I do, ooh, so here's the thing. We talk a lot about Jesus coming, and I want the band to come up, um, to forgive us of our sins. And I am so thankful for that. I am so, so, so grateful that I could sort of tell you just a little bit about my story, and please don't think I'm brave because I didn't tell you the bad parts. I'm not that transparent. Um, and it's great that Jesus forgives sin. I am so, so glad. But I'm glad that's not why he came. You know, as much as we like to say Jesus came to forgive us of our sins, oh, that's still not enough, is it? Like, let me just give you this example, and I won't use you because that'd be awkward. I'll use me. Like, a lot of times we talk about Jesus forgiving us of our sins, and I believe that's true. So if I said, is it possible that I could just blow up my life and cheat on my wife and lose my family and, and, and just, is it possible that I could do that? Yeah, well, maybe not. I don't get a lot of offers, but possibly, hypothetically, that could happen, right? The right stretchy jeans. I don't know, but like, hypothetically, that could happen. So let's talk about that. Let's say I disappointed you and I broke up my family and I hurt my wife and I hurt my daughter and I blew up our finances and we got... Would Jesus forgive that? I believe he would. But guess what? Guess what? I don't want Jesus to forgive me of that. I want Jesus to save me from that. Because guess what? Forgiveness isn't a time machine, even though that might be true, and I believe it is. It wouldn't fix my family. It wouldn't fix the hurt. It wouldn't even fix, like, the disappointment you would feel because I did that. And so what I would say to you this morning is like, oh, yes, does Jesus forgive sins? Absolutely, I believe that. I know that's true. I'm forgiven. But man, it's so, so much better than that. See, Jesus actually came to save us from our sins. To actually, and here's the thing I know about you as well and I know about me. You know, the Bible says something so offensive. Let me just read it to you. I don't want to end without reading you one more offensive thing. Uh, 1 Corinthians says this. It says, run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. And people are so offended by that. They're like, how can you say sexual sin is worse than any other sin? It doesn't say it's worse than. It says it affects you more. And you and I know that's true, even though we hate reading that. We know that maybe if you blow up your finances, you could recover fully. Or we know maybe you even blow up your reputation and you do something illegal. and maybe You could come out of prison and maybe rebuild that life where everyone trusted you again. But man, there are just some things sexually that you'll never get past. We don't tell people who are victims of rape or victims of incest. We don't just go, hey, walk it off. They've, they're in jail. It's over. No, we know. And you and I know that some of our deepest, most painful secrets, some of the things that, oh, if we could just change, they usually revolve around something sexual that we've done or something that happened to us. And so my prayer for you, and I'm going to pray for you, um, is, man, we can trust that Jesus will forgive us of sin. But I think why we need Scripture and why we shouldn't sort of throw out these tight uncomfortable white pants that the scripture because here's the thing it can save us from ourselves save us for, and that is so 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 much better and i'm so glad of that god in heaven um we come to you and uh god we are sinful people i'm a sinful man and god i'm so so grateful for your forgiveness and god i pray that you would just put in my heart even more empathy and more care for others. I say, hey, I understand, but I know I don't. 
And God, I know we've got people all over the room who are struggling with this because we all do. I know all over the room we're feeling uncomfortable and we're feeling like, oh, I hate that or that's harsh. And God, I feel the same way when I wake up and try to put these pants on on Tuesday mornings. But God, I'm so grateful that you forgive our sins. But God, I'm even more more thankful that it's possible that you could save us from our sins, save us from ourselves, save us from all of the hurt that we could bring on ourselves and others. And we're just going to believe you to guide us through that difficult, difficult process. In your name we pray, amen.